This YouTuber has already raised $100,000 from his fans by selling his YouTube channel, and it's turning out to be a huge scam, and I'm here to tell you why. Arguably one of the best content creators on this platform just announced he'd be selling a 10% stake in his business, but is this offer really a good deal or is there something we're not seeing? Jack is in debt due to trying to buy out his former business partner. The debt is Jack buying the co-founder of the LLC, Jordan's, 50% shares for $500,000. The crazy valuation, the bad debt, the lies, I'm out. He's not re-emerged publicly on social media since. Yeah, it's funny, this camera has like, it's stuck on demo mode. Okay. <laughs> so it's like, it's kind of a bit, right? Just, you have to turn it off like every 15 minutes. Yeah, that's great. I love that that uh, these camcorders are coming back. It really is like you can't replicate it, you know, digitally. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, no. I mean, let's just let's just talk openly and transparently. Uh, I'm I'm really um, glad, you know, to, to be reconnecting with you, and I'm I'm um, I'm glad that you're open to talking about this, just because I am so curious to hear, you know, your side of it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just want to want to listen and and hear you hear you out. Yeah, yeah. I think it'd be kind of cool to start maybe at the beginning. It was for me my last year of high school, right? And uh, kind of you know the young the young individual facing the two paths of life. It's like, especially in America, it's like. You know, do you take the college route? Do you kind of go the more traditional route and try to get a degree and get a job? Or do you kind of pursue this other path of figuring it out without a structure? And so I chose the, the latter, right? And I remember it was my last year of high school and I was going to drop out and just get a GED because I was homeschooled, right? And I actually had to repeat my last year. Um, but thankfully, my parents really encouraged me to just kind of stick it through. Um, but during that summer, I basically took a couple months and just kind of went hiking, went backpacking. And that was kind of the first time of really flying the, flying the nest a little bit. And it was funny, on the drive back, my grandpa actually gave me his old truck. And so I had a really cool opportunity to kind of like drive it across the U.S., right? But on the drive back, my dad was working in North Dakota and I was staying with him for a couple of weeks and I was just really toying over like, you know, what am I going to do with my life? I only have a year left. I was listening to this artist and he was kind of really talking about like just going for it. Right. You know, just, just pushing ahead, putting yourself out there. And so I was like, all right, you know, I'll just go on Craigslist. Right. I'll see what graphic design jobs there are. Cause I've been trying to build my graphic design portfolio, trying to, trying to own my skills and came across this ad for Hey Joe Coffee. And I was like, okay, what is this? This is like a startup. It's kind of like a technology thing, mixing tech, mixing coffee. I like coffee. So I applied to it. And I'm interested to hear your side because from my perspective, I'm like typing an application. And from your perspective, you've been presumably in the startup world in businesses for, you know, however long you had been in um yeah i mean at that stage uh i i hadn't really been in in uh startup that was really my first startup i had been uh well I, that's not true actually i i did have a a business that i ran in a completely different uh industry right out of college i i was in a um um started a health clinic with with my wife um, in, in bioidentical hormone replacement, totally random. Um, and then moved into product development. I was actually running a business, um, for someone else at that point. And then I, um, a part of that strategy was to diversify the products. And so, 
you know, we had a really a group of people around that idea and uh, Kickstarter was, was really like emerging. And it was like, um, everyone was kind of figuring out what to do with it. And, you know, we were like, this, this seems like an opportunity to uh, build a prototype, put a concept out there and, um, and see if we can make something. But my experience in product development at that stage of my career was, uh, um, I was still learning, like I was traveling, I was going to China and learning how to develop, um, mostly metal products. So it wasn't, I wasn't in electronics or technology, but, um, I was definitely interested in moving, you know, expanding our core competency. Um, and so, or really, I guess one of the, the appeals for me in that project was building more of a branded product because a lot of the products that I made were, um, private label products. I mean, they were just for, it was just like a cost competition and it, it was kind of loveless. Like you would build products for retailers and slap their label on it. And, you know, it was cool cause I learned a lot about product design and manufacturing and sourcing and all this. Um, but the actual process of, of building a brand was, was really what appealed to me. And, um, that's when I put the, the ad on Craigslist. Cause I thought, well, if we're going to build a brand, we need someone who can, uh, a good designer. And it's funny. I, I forgot that that was from Craigslist. It's funny you bring that up. Um, Craigslist was such a, I mean, I know it's still around, but it was just, it had such a wave. Um, I just had a funny, you know, experience the craigslist but the, i do remember when i put that ad out i mean you would just get a flood of responses flood of resumes and people applying and i remember i was in china when i was looking through those resumes i was reading through them and yours like uh or actually no no, no i'm sorry I, I went to china right after we met you and i met but i remember your resume stuck out um like far out of everyone else's resume with something so simple. It was just the way that you designed your resume. I mean, you put like a simple border or something. It was just like, it just popped out. And I was like, huh, who's this? And, um, and yeah, we started working together from there. That was like one of the most exciting things because it was one such a relief to get a job right <laughs> in an industry that I wanted to crack into the industry being like doing something creative as a living. Um, and so I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity. I think I was talking about this with a friend. I think one of the things that are, that's kind of lost in the current new world, I'd say, versus like the old world, the old world being like, I don't know, 1500s, 1600s, European, the new world being America and in our, current times it's like the idea of a, an apprenticeship like learning a craft learning how a business operates from someone that's been in the industry even five years longer than you even a decade longer than you and so that time i think was i always thought of it in my mind as like being in a blacksmith shop <laughs> with someone and and learning a trade learning a craft and so that time was super valuable it was it was a it was a blast it was working with you, but then also in the tech village, just kind of being surrounded by all of these startups. And I remember feeling very, uh, uh imposter syndrome, <laughs> but then, you know, just, just working through that and continuing to create stuff was, it was a blast. Yeah. It's funny you say that. I think that's really just uh, a natural part of the process for, for really any, you know, entrepreneur, um, or anyone doing a startup is, is going through that imposter syndrome you know, really, no matter what stage you're at, it just always feels like you're, um, you're in over your head, you know, and you have to, um, kind of, I don't want to say fake it till you make it, but it, it seems as though that's kind of the game. I mean, cause it's like you either do what you're talking about. You, you work with someone that has more experience and learn as you go, or you, uh, figure it out as you go. But yeah, Atlanta Tech Village, I th that was an inspiring time uh, for sure. I, I do I do remember that as a as a fond experience. Um, 
and we we did a lot of stuff i mean you know initially it was hajo coffee and uh you know that just took up i don't know a year and a half of my life and i learned a tremendous amount from that experience about product development um but yeah we transitioned into a, f a few other things and that's really where disrupt was was born i think i was working on hey joe like a a graphic and i remember on my lunch break i saw the trailer for the vive like this vr thing and i was like oh that's it that's the that's the future of media and technology so then working with you having like the the padding i think for a creative person it's like once you have your bills paid for then it's like okay i can kind of let the mind really go into the abstract creativity and so that time period when we were both simultaneously working on hey joe working on um, different products for other people it was like okay on my weekends, on my nights, I now have this time to carve out for for doing these 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 VR projects, and then bringing that to you, I think, is where it really was able to be taken to the next level because it was like, okay, now it's not just weekends, now it's not just moonlighting disrupt. It's actually becoming like a an actual thing that I can focus on throughout the day. And then I think that was when that was around the same time that we moved to east atlanta yeah which that that was even i think more exciting for me than atlanta tech village in some ways yeah. I, I think you know we lost that connection with all the you know atlanta tech village was great for networking and like being around other startups and that energy um but it also fostered a pretty severe coffee addiction too you know with the <laughs> it said coffee on tap uh but that's beside the point the but it, East Atlanta was cool because it was like we were at a, at a, at a certain point we moved from focusing on the products and the brands that we were creating there to full time focused on disrupt and kind of the digital products or the uh, fleshing out the ideas for what we wanted to build and that became basically full time with we would work on these side projects to help fund it you know so I would look for opportunities to to generate income so that we could kind of like put it back into the studio in, in whatever way that we could. But when we moved to East Atlanta, it was like, that was the studio. It was, you know, that was the vision for us. Like, that's going to be, this is going to be where we can, you know, really film things we've got. We had like 3,500 square feet of space, uh, rooftop deck. I mean, it was just, it was inspiring in a different way. It was like, we kind of like graduated from this, you know, um, I don't know, 600 square foot or no, it was 150 square foot, like, startup you know glass room to this i mean proper studio you know it was uh it was a fun time mm -hmm. yeah it was really interesting to i still think of the vibe in east atlanta um, there's definitely some dark parts to it but it's also a very artistic creative area um i think it was also like <clears throat> i think that was when we transitioned from um, like VR studio, trying to create like VR content, then to switching into like YouTube, right? And trying to find a revenue model that would be able to self fund the studio. And so it was really try to create a brand so that when VR would match what I thought it would be, that we would already be established. And so that's kind of where I started creating like these these um, video essays, right? And that studio space was was paramount in that because it was providing a space to let the creativity flow. And then I think that transitioned into the week in VR, which was the turning point. When we moved into the studio, uh, one of the first weeks there after we had all our you know furniture, we had like a table set up. Uh, we got a whiteboard out and then we started working through, you know, where Disrupt started and where we were going. And I think that was like, uh, you know, there, there obviously was already some content on YouTube, but that, that was where, you know, that became a big part of the, the roadmap. It was like, let's, let's create, you know, educational 
content for specifically for virtual reality uh, to build a targeted audience, um, you know, that shares a similar interest. And in parallel, we were exploring these other digital products. So we transitioned away from just making VR content uh, to looking into something like, you know, holographic audiobooks. Like we spent a lot, I think a year um, working on proof of concepts and trying to, to, you know, work through the feasibility of building a product and then, you know, having an audience to, uh, uh, that was, that was interested that we, that we could provide value to for, for something like that. Um, and, and I remember a, a week in VR, um, I think it was right around your 21st birthday when, uh, I, I, I insisted in to I sent you to Peru. <laughs> I was like, you should go to Peru, Jack. Um, I think you would like it. And, uh, and you went there and you, it was, it was like, almost like you meditated on this whole shift. And then you came back and you were like, I've got an idea. Um, can you watch Lucy? And I was like, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I remember going through that too. That was, that was a crazy time. Um, I think the studio really changed at that point. Yeah, it's funny. In retrospect, I think that was the shift to when Disrupt became something that was more, I mean, it was it just entered the wider ocean, right? So a lot more eyes on it. But that was simultaneously <clears throat> also like a really dark time for me. Um, going through Peru. Um, I think the last, like, I mean, it's, I guess it's all part of growing up, but when I went to Peru, I did ayahuasca, right? And it was going through this ritual and tapping into another realm that was beyond the physical world. And then directly getting that idea from an entity in that physical world. And in retrospect, I mean, my beliefs are that that was a demon. <laughs> and so it's interesting to see in retrospect where the ideas came from. And I think in my belief, I'm an Orthodox Christian and in the belief is that everything works out for good. Even something that could have been intended for evil works out for good. And I think that's evident today and evident even throughout the journey, right? Because looking in retrospect, it's like there's dark times, but then there's, there's light times. There's times for learning and times for growth that I think we both experienced. Um, it's, it's interesting to hear your account of um, kind of how that all came to be coming from Peru and, and it being more of, uh, you know, you look back on it positively, but it, it, in, in the moment it was, kind of a deeply uh, negative or dark experience for you. And, you know, you never really communicated that to me at the time, but I did kind of wonder, you know, if some of this conflict that arose between us, um, I I know your background, like you were brought up for Christian um, or religious, um, and you kind of, I guess as you aged, I don't want to say got away from it, but you, at least in my experience, you were, um, you know, you, you, um, I guess got away from it. Yeah. You, you got yeah, away from it a bit. And, and I wonder if, cause I know you've come back to it now and, and, um, I guess those experiences like in Peru and there were some other ones, you know, I, I feel as though I was somewhat responsible for um, for those experiences that you had in terms of, you know, I guess being an influence in, in some respects. And so knowing that you look back on it as kind of like this dark experience, I wonder as, as if you, you know, as, as you transition back into, um, you know, your, your faith, that if in some ways you viewed me as, um, uh, you know, 
related to that or a uh, kind of a, a bad influence, so to speak. I don't know. I, I, I guess um, for me, you know, the, the challenge with going through everything that we did over the past year or two or whatever was more um, coming to, you know, coming to assumptions because the communication kind of dropped off. Not kind of, I mean, it did, you know, um, you know, before you, you end up moving to, to where you are now. And so I ended up just trying to make sense of it. Like, you know, it's, uh, where was the falling out? Where was the, where was the, because there was something that, you know, caused, um, some, some anger. And I didn't know if maybe it had to do with that. So, so hearing, I guess that that was such a dark experience for you. I thought I didn't know that. And, um, and yeah, I guess it, it kind of kicks that. Yeah. That well, I, wandry up. I should, I should clarify. I think I appreciate you, um, feeling a certain sense of responsibility though, I would, um, turn it back and say that I believe Christ, I believe God has, uh, given us the gift of free will. Right. And so I never blame you. I never blame anyone for the decisions that at the end of the day I made, uh, you know, I chose to, to take psychedelics. I chose to go as deep as I could into the world beyond our physical reality. Right. And, um, I don't, I don't blame anyone else other than myself for doing that. And like I said, I think it, it worked out for the better, you know, there's a, <clears throat> in the Orthodox tradition, we, it, it's, it's a, it's a very long tradition of telling the stories of Christ himself, but obviously those who have followed him after the fact, after for the past, you know, 2000 years, and we call them the saints, right? And so there's a saint that almost parallels exactly my path. <clears throat> and so it's, it's not blaming anyone. It's, it's a pattern that happens <laughs> with artists. And I thank Christ every day that I was saved from the dark times that I experienced during that period. But when we, when I think back, the lack of communication on my end was more, was less because I felt you were a bad influence and more because I almost felt like I was doing all the work and you were reaping the rewards. And, um, I think in retrospect, a lot of that was lies being fed into my left ear, right? It's like, this guy is just taking your money and you're sitting at your computer for 12 hours a day, editing videos and releasing them. And you're the face of this channel. It was a lot of pride that was coming from my end. And so that's, it was, I think in retrospect, it was, it was in large part pride. And then also trying to explore, you know, maybe this partnership could continue or maybe this partnership would be better left in the past. Like, is there a possibility that disrupt could just be myself? And so that was when I um, reached out to you and, and requested a buyout. And so I'm interested to hear what was your mindset when you heard that? Was it a feeling of hurt or was it, what was the reaction? I think that I under, without you communicating those things to me, like I understood that that was your living experience just because, you know, in a lot of respects you didn't, you know, once the channel reached success and you are the face of it, like you don't, you don't need me anymore. Right. Um, and so I understood that vantage point. Um, I don't necessarily think that that was true because I think that we both play very different roles in, in uh, our business relationship. One being, you know, I was more business development. Uh, I had experience with running businesses and, you know, you were definitely the creative force behind disrupt and, um, 
I, I, I think though that we worked together, you know, we, we would cross over in a lot of those ways and, and we worked well because, um, you know, we, we communicated well, you know, I would, I would throw an idea to you and we got to a point after work together for seven years where you would know exactly what I was thinking and then you would put it into uh, a visual format. And so, you know, I, I think there, there was a lot of crossover, but regardless, um, I, I understood why you felt that way. I was definitely disappointed because for me, I, I felt a bit betrayed in the sense that, um, I guess, I looked at it differently. I, I know that you were uh, doing the the editing and, and creating the content for Disrupt, but I also spent the last four years or whatever it was, you know, working my job uh, in, in running the businesses that I was to to make that possible. And and kind of the at least in in my my recollection of it was you know, all the we would go on trips and we would spend basically every day in the studio together and uh while i may not have been editing videos i was working on ways to to fund the studio and i was working with you on these concepts and the the uh the products that we were developing for the studio and you know all, all these things and ultimately what we would always come to is hey you know as soon as the studio is in the right position and i can offset my current income with income from the studio I'll be able to come do this full time, you know. That's the ultimate dream for me, and uh, and and focus on it and be able to to contribute more. So what happened for me at the time when you approached me was that I actually closed down the other business that I was running because we were getting to that point. Um, there were some other things going on, you know, with China, and I just ultimately my dream was to work with the studio. That was always what I was working towards. And so when I made that shift in my life, it was a very big deal for me. And, uh, you know, because I was left with, you know, I had two things and I, I got rid of this one so I could move over to this one. And basically as that happened, you know, these kind of, um, breakdowns in communication were occurring in parallel. And then, then that's when you proposed that to me and, uh, and so, yeah, I was, I was disappointed for sure because it was like, it was a hard transition for me to make. Um, but it was also something I'd been working towards for so long. Um, and so it, it left me in a, in a pretty precarious position, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I accepted the proposal that we worked through because I thought that if it, if it were to pan out, that I would at least have some, some room to rebuild something, um, but that's why a year later I came back and you know, I had to go get, go get a job and, uh, excuse me, and, you know, to pay my mortgage and starting a family, like all these things, you know, you need health insurance. And I had just kind of dissolved my other thing. Um, and so it changed my life. And, uh, so a year later, I mean, I was a little, I started to get resentful, you know, about that and, kind of like, Hey man, like this, this changes the directory of my life. Like I, I'm not gonna, I, I don't necessarily want to take this all back over, but let, let's give it another shot. If, if, you know, if this isn't really to me, what I thought in my mind was, you know, maybe Jack sees now after a year of this, that, um, my, my value in the business, maybe he understands, you know, that I can help with the business development. I can help find ways to generate income or revenue for, for, for the studio to make it viable. Um, and you know, he can continue to, to basically continue operating the capacity that we did before. And that's kind of what I was thinking, but I just didn't, I didn't realize it was going to go the way that it did. And, uh, and that's why I said like, in retrospect, I, I definitely would have approached that differently. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think, like I said, it was, from my vantage point, I wasn't looking at the foundation that you had provided to build Disrupt. Um, and so my thought process was more, okay, Jordan has, we've worked together and this foundation has been built. 
is it possible now that I can almost take, I can almost fly <laughs> from that foundation and hopefully provide some income to, to Jordan. But hearing your side makes a lot of sense because you actually had wanted to fly with the disrupt plane and not just be the runway for it. And I, I didn't recognize that at, that at the time. Um, I think not for yeah. lack of communication on your end, more for the blindness of pride on my end. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the other tricky part is that we didn't really have um, a product at that point, you know, like we had gone through some experimentation. And I think that the really the common ground that you and I always related on is that we were both, I think, self-defined futurists, right? Like we really... Um, could sit in a room all day and geek out about the future. And uh, I think that one of the things that I learned over my experience with product development and even digital products is that it's not just about having a good idea, um, but it's, it's very much also about timing. And I think that a lot of things we were working on were just a ahead of schedule. And... Um, so by the time that we got to where we were, I mean, really what we were talking about was a YouTube studio. Um, but in my mind, it was still always, the roadmap was still to build a product um, together um, that was, you know, facing the, the spirit of Disrupt, which was in this kind of, um, you know, mixed reality, uh, virtual reality space. And... You know, YouTube was just a, 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 an outlet to express creativity, grow a relevant audience, and just kind of fund that product that we would build in parallel. But at the time that all this happened, it was just, you know, it appeared as though we were just talking about a YouTube studio, which I can understand, you know, why y you would look at it the way that you did, um, thinking like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm the face of this now and and you know wh what's what's Jordan gonna do you know what I mean um so but my hope was like hey you know when we when we make this transition you know if we collaborate like I think we can we can we can double our our output you know because I think that was always one of the challenges for Disrupt is that we just didn't have because the the approach of, to the content is so high caliber. Um, you know, it's, we really set the bar high and, um, or you did, excuse me, uh, you, you set a high bar. So my thinking was, well, you know, why don't we figure out a way to improve or, or, uh, our output? Is that's when I came into the studio and I started saying, well, hey, why don't I work on a content schedule? I'll, I'll uh, you know, build I'll interview writers and we'll start working on scripts to um, get these high level stories like in the pipeline so that we can kind of like reduce the amount of time of production. And so th this is kind of how like where my skill set is, is in building systems and business development. And that's just how I, I think. So I was looking for a way to try to add value there, but it just all got kind of thrown into this this era, uh, you know, that we were, um, there's two things going on at once, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, that was an interesting period because it was, I think it, we, we were almost there. Like if in the perfect world, maybe not the perfect world because I think it, everything happened for a reason, but in the alternative timeline, um, I think that was the route like that. I think that still is a route that a lot of channels are taking, which is like this, this specifically YouTube studio that kind of mixes more of the traditional route of hiring writers, hiring more of a team, a backend to produce a caliber of content that is above um, what's found on YouTube a lot of the time. So that I think that that does seem to be where shifted to like 
then once I proposed the split of the partnership, um, it was like, okay, now I got to figure this out on my own <laughs> to fulfill this so that I can own it. Um, towards, towards that last or that first call where you wanted to break off the, um, the plan that we were on because I couldn't fulfill the payments. It was like a simultaneous thought on my end where it was like, okay, I feel like I'm finally in the flow of Disrupt. I have like a team of editors that are more talented than me and I'm trying to lead them into creating content. And then, but I also have this like, in my mind, it was like something in the back trying to chase me. And then I remember receiving the call from you and it was just like the world came crashing down because I had been idolizing Disrupt. It was like one part of my life, this channel, this company came crashing down. But then the true part of my life, a life in Christ was beginning to flourish. <laughs> but I didn't want to let go of the other part, the disrupt part. And so my mindset then shifted to like, okay, I don't want to continue this partnership with, with, with Jordan for whatever reason, for, for pride, for vanity, but also a misalignment because if I am diving deeper into Christianity, the content that I'm making now I don't feel attached to it. It's like, I'm just creating content to get views. And so it was like a shift. It's like, okay, well, I can continue disrupt with Jordan and slowly, slowly begin to hate the content that I'm making, or I could try to raise money to own Disrupt and transition the content into what I ultimately want to create, which is content that glorifies Christ. And I, the vehicle to do that, I thought was crowdfunding. And so I've been working on that for maybe three months in order to fulfill the payments that I had owed to you. And then the call came to where you wanted to rejoin Disrupt. And so it was like, okay, well, this thing is aligning. I've already been working on trying to crowdfund Disrupt, trying to sell a portion of the company in kind of this, this new realm of crowd-based investment. So I'll try it. You know, I got nothing to lose at this point. And so from my perspective, it was like, okay, I have three months to create this campaign and the SEC rules say that I can't say how the money will be spent from my understanding. So I will try to paint a picture to where if we raise this money, I will be able to continue the content. And if we don't, something bad will happen. And when I think back today, I really regret saying something bad will happen. I think that painted you in a bad light. It, because that was a lot, that, that was the first introduction that the disrupt audience had to you. And the first introduction was this person, me, that they had been seeing on the face of the channel saying this quote unquote evil guy is going to come and take over disrupt. And that wasn't fair. That wasn't a, that wasn't a gentleman thing to do, you know? And so, um, I think the, the audience kind of, I think when we don't speak truthfully, when we try to paint a picture from a place that isn't correct, um, people that are more attuned 
to truth can suss that out. And I think that happened. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, it, it definitely created some challenges for sure. Um, but you know, again, I keep coming back to this, but everything's clear in, in, uh, in retrospect. I mean, the, the trouble with situations like that, especially something that you're so deeply connected with and feeling like, you know, it's being threatened is that, you know, you, you're just going to experience the most intense emotions that, you know, that you can. And so, um, that's just something I think that we, we learn as we get older, uh, is that in those moments, like, like, yes, it's about how you react to it after the things that you do, but being able to see clearly when you're in the middle of that is, uh, well, that's the, that's the thing, you know? Um, I mean, I'm glad that you can look back on it and, and, uh, you know, that you've come to this. I mean, it makes me feel better because it's like, I mean, Jack, I can't even explain to you much of a, of a, um, I'm going to use proper language, uh, just of a mental conflict, you know, this has caused for me, not just in terms of like, oh, you know, how do I, um, deal with this kind of like perception of me that that's been painted that's that's whatever you know like like you said i think people people can people are smart enough to to you know if i get on camera and explain my side of it they'll be the judge of it you know like they can see the truth and if people want to believe you then fine if you want to believe me then that's just what it is you know like it's definitely a challenge but really the on the personal side of it it's been just weird for me to like try to come to the right assumption about you know what it was that you were experiencing but as you explain it i mean it it really seems pretty straightforward i mean it's kind of the, the easiest explanation uh or, or the one that, that's at the top of the list when you start going through things you're like well you know was it was it uh you know that the jack thought I, I pushed these things onto him like in peru and you know then he moved to christianity like that that's probably uh more of a, a conspiracy theory for me right but it's like these kind of things that i i work through um to understand it but yeah all that makes sense i mean definitely has been a challenge and it's 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 caused the you know for me now would disrupt what i'm um trying to find is the right voice because i think um you know disrupt even though I, I haven't been the voice or the face of it i have been very heavily involved with it and it's always been for me about it's just been an evolution of thought of development and of just experimentation and so that's kind of where i'm at with it now is like you know i had to pick this up from where it was and um and I, and I want to make sure to preserve the spirit of the studio, especially for, for you know, uh, uh, the audience. But I also want to stay true to, you know, I guess what, what um, where I think the studio sh should go next. And so that's kind of where I'm at with everything now is trying to, to, uh, to figure that out. Yeah, that's one of the things I appreciate about your business sense and um, even in the early days of Hey Joe. And I think you are very much an individual. You know that movie where they're on like a train in the winter? I forget what it's called. It's like Snow Train or something. It's like in a post-apocalyptic movie. Have you seen that? Um, It's possible. I'm not sure yet keep going with it <laughs> what is this movie I, it's i've not seen this but it sounds i don't have to google sounds it. good one second it's gonna i already like the plot snow piercer there we go but the idea is like this this train and it just there's this conflict inside the train there's these people inside the train they're always 
conflicting with each other, much like society. But the train is always going, right? It's always on the track. It's been going for however long these people have been in the train, right? There's generations in this train that have grown. The conflict happens, but the train moves forward. And I think you have that business sense where, you know, this conflict of disrupt happened. I have willfully decided to leave the train because while I enjoyed disrupt, it was a part of my life that I learned a lot from and I, I grew a lot from when any band breaks up, it's like, you know, we had a good run and I'm going to jump off. But the individuals in that band continue to create their own things. And so I think you have the sense. And since you were there from the inception, I think you have the know-how in bringing disrupt to the vision that you see for it. And so I'm really interested to see what you and I think there's some of the, the original editors that I was working with are still on there, which I'm overjoyed to see. Yeah, me too. I, I wish, uh, you know, I, I'm back at kind of square one with disrupt in terms of like, I, I can't afford to spend all my time on it. You know, right now I, I'm, I'm back to, you know, I've got to, I've got to pay bills and I've got a uh, baby on the way, which is crazy. Um, and so, you know, again, disrupt is like the ultimate, it's, it's back to being like the dream, you know, but um, it's just more of i I've got to spend time trying to just build it. So I, I'm looking at, at it more now as just like a passion project and, and um, like trying to have a creative outlet, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a journey and um, I'm excited about it too. I think that there's a lot of passion behind Disrupt as, as a, as a channel. And I think that, you know, you, you fostered a lot of that. I think People are inspired by dis it's it creates it's both great and and one of the biggest challenges is the the expectation for content quality from us is like you know as high as it gets on YouTube and um, I think that's awesome because it, it pushes you to to um, create something that's meaningful to you you know individually as a creator like everyone carries that spirit with them into the content that they're creating but it also poses a huge challenge which is like um it's just very difficult to to build a sustainable you know youtube model on that without you know um because it's there's just it's not you know most people with with an uh, audience over a million it's no problem to to monetize but like for stuff like we're approached by sponsors all the time as an example like i've got a my inbox is filled with sponsors wanting to pay us to to put products in the videos and it's it's always something that i'm like well you know uh it's i know it's smart to do that from a business standpoint but i have to fight it because it's like, like i know how much it would it just bothers me like how, how much it could potentially diminish the quality of the products that we're putting out. So we have to think around these things because it's not a traditional channel. Disrupt is not a, a normal YouTube channel. I don't want it to be a normal YouTube channel. So um, that's one of the things I'm working on is a way to, to be able to, to continue to just create content for creating content. And um, um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil any surprises, but we will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cover it with you. Maybe when we're not, recording this but we're working on building more of a community for creators um so yeah I, I think that that's something that'll that'll push us in the direction that i think that i think really um is in line aligned with the, the spirit of the studio that that really you know you started and uh people are are uh inspired by so yeah yeah you started it as well man i think uh yeah i won't 
I won't try to peek more into what you're what you're planning to build, but it sounds like a good route. Um, I think the community building a centered community on a centered topic, I think is is always valuable. So I'm interested to see more what that what that's about. Back to the to the the content side, I think that's that's what's interesting to see on YouTube now. It's like it's almost I almost see this wave of like less edited content is what people are enjoying as well. I think there's, mm -hmm. I think everything's so divided, right? Like we have so many music genres as an example. There's no like one music genre that's what everyone listens to. And similarly with content, even on YouTube and now with Twitter or X or whatever it's called. Um, there's so many different types of content. There's just like the turning on a camera and talking. There's highly edited stuff. There's in between. And so I have to say half of this impetus to want to record this is some sense of uh, selfishness and that I want to share also with the audience what I've been working on. Um, well, I'm sure everyone's interested, you know. I, I think people will be will be happy to hear from you. And, uh, and yeah, I'm curious too, you know, to know, you know, we're catching up for the first time really in like a year. So... I'm curious to know, you know, what, what are you working on and, and what, uh, what's kind of your vision for, for Jack 2.0, you know, <laughs> I'd say it's what I'm calling harmony, which is this concept in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is like, we believe we're put on this world so that we can grow in the likeness of Christ. Um, the belief is that we are made in his image and we are made in his likeness. And so we have the image set, right? Like we come out of the womb and we're these individuals that are experiencing sensory reality in this way. But the likeness is where we all fail daily. It's like, there's not a day that I wake up and I <laughs> don't sin in thought and word and deed. But when the individual strives towards Christ, strives towards growing in likeness to God through his grace and through what we do in physical reality. There's this idea of harmony where the heavens are working to bring you to salvation. And so that's kind of going back to a lot of the stories of these saints on the wall. It's like these guys have lived these lives for Christ it's like, why would you live a life for a, a legend, a tale, a fictional story? But it's like, these guys died for something. And so I can't believe that they died for a fictional tale. They died for something that is tangible, something that is truth. And so their stories have been passed down from generations to generations in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And so my ultimate goal is to be able to tell their stories using modern technology, tell the stories of truth using modern technologies in harmony. So that's kind of the more creative side. And um, maybe if you could put a link down below in the description to the, the latest yeah. film that I created with that, that'd be awesome. But yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think people will be really interested to know. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, it, it's, I'm really happy to hear that because when I, you know, I, I guess the time that we've had between when we last spoke and now, um, thinking about you just kind of like out in a cabin in Alaska, in the woods, um, off, off the grid, you know, off the internet, like, I, I know that's a fun place to be, but it's, it's also, um, to me, it's just a waste of of uh talent you know like if not to say living in the woods is a waste of talent but like knowing that you're continuing to work on what you know you're uh so gifted at is is um is good to hear so i'm, I'm glad that you're not like just gonna be a monk you know what i mean and like right off the internet um i did have concerns about that 
just because for, for the world, you know, I think that, that, uh, yeah, you've got a lot of talent to share. And so I think that's probably why people will be really interested to know what you're, what you're building. Thank you, man. And likewise, I, uh, I'm going to be keeping an eye on disrupt. And I think the audience that has followed me in the past, but also the new audience that you guys have been growing. Um, I think knowing your track record and knowing your persistence and your stubbornness to create something that is um, successful, that being channeled, even if it's a passion project, that being channeled into anything, I think will create some great results. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Yeah, thanks. Just uh, my only concern is time, you know, I, uh, I'm a little nervous having a, a child for the first time. I don't know what that's going to be like, but um, whenever I have um, the bandwidth, I'm thinking about it. Mm. Well, yeah. At least you're not the first to have a child, right? People have figured it out. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. That, that's the only thing that keeps me um, above water. <laughs> On that, you know, it's doable. It's doable. Well, cool, Jordan. It's been a it's been a blessing. Thanks for reaching out, man. Yeah, same to you. And, and by the way, I uh, I'm sorry, I missed your your email. Um, I didn't realize you were you were in town until after you had left i would have uh gladly got gotten together with you oh no problem glad we could connect at least through the uh great internet dimension yeah the portal of the internet what a time to be alive and now now we're uh doing it through old technology just because we can you know vhs bringing it back <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>